This is the Sunday service from Exeter Vineyard Church. A very warm welcome to you all for those of us that know each other and also those that uh, are new and we haven't actually met yet. We look forward to doing that. In a moment we're going to start off with encouragement from the Bible and after that we're going to hear some musical worship to help us centre ourselves on how good God is. It's a good time to try and switch off from everything that's going on around us um, during the week and over the, the months that we spend at home. Lots of people have got quite a few things going on. It's very difficult to lay it down sometimes, but now is a good time to do that. So find a comfy seat, and take a breath, and maybe close your eyes and concentrate on the moment. <clears throat> then we'll hand over to Dave and Sarah, and you'll have to open your eyes to have a look at them. After that, uh, Dave will share some thoughts from the book of Ephesians, which we're looking at this term, and then we'll have an opportunity to prayerfully reflect on it. And if you find yourselves in these times as well uh, of difficulty and you're finding yourselves a bit really disconnected from everything and everybody, I found it really helpful to connect with a hub group. Um, you'll be able to find details of that online. So during this time when, uh, as a family, we haven't had the words to actually speak to God with or be able to pray or even connect in any way, they've done it on our behalf and we felt extremely supported in that so i would encourage you to connect to a hub group which is just a small group outside of church and we're all still zooming but actually it's a good way of connecting with other people so i recommend that to you so let's pray and then we'll read from the bible god even though we're not physically together we're so thankful for your presence and for uniting us we ask this morning that you would connect, we would connect with you and be open to what you do. Amen. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in times of need.
for the week commencing the 16th of May. It's just myself today because we haven't got a lot of news to talk to you about. We've just um, got all our usual activities as well as we're meeting to plan the rest of the year now that restrictions are easing. So I thought I'd say hi and I thought we'd pray together as well. So loving God, you are making us into your bride in your body. Help us live in your love and work for your glory. We pray all the things we do would bring fruit for your kingdom. Amen. The other day, I'm just minding my own business, getting on with something, when Sarah rushes in and she's all excited. She'd just seen this video on TikTok and it had this bit of information and she said, this has totally blown my mind. I'd never thought about this before. This was a complete surprise. And she tells me, and I'm not interested, it's not relevant, I'm not really that surprised. So I'm just like, oh, whatever, you know, and she's like really excited. I'm like, yeah, whatever. I think sometimes when we read the Bible, it can be a bit like that. We can uh, read it and just not really connect with it and think, well, whatever, kind of, I think I knew that already. So at the moment, we are reading through the book of Ephesians and we're doing this spiritual practice called Digging for Gems, where we rewrite the passage in our own words to capture the meaning, to explain the meaning. And we can't use things like religious jargon because we need to be able to explain it to someone who's never been to church before. And I don't know if you're finding the same, but I'm finding as I do that and I'm expanding these ideas, I'm using loads of exclamation marks because I get through the passage all of a sudden, the passion, the excitement, the amazement that Paul is feeling when he writes this, but it doesn't always come across in the Bible. So I'll give you an example. In today's passage, uh, chapter three, verse eight, it says that uh, God graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ full stop. It's not even an exclamation mark. So this is, I think, this is kind of how it goes on in my head. It goes, God graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. Please itemize all your endless treasures, ensuring each is in the correct column and any deductible endless treasures are clearly noted and filed in triplicate. It just kind of feels like this dry religious document. And so in this passage, Paul's talking about something that is so exciting. He has totally changed his life and revolved his life around this new idea. He's gone to prison for it. He's given up all his kind of past stuff and he's ended up in prison because there's something so exciting going on. And so he's not experienced something that is kind of like the most respectable middle class life with a God thing kind of slotted on to make us a bit better which is sometimes how we think about Christianity. I think we think, well, you can have a good life, but it'll be a little bit better if you also become a Christian. You know, try, try and do the life, the best life that the world can offer. And then if you add God, it gets a little bit better. Paul's saying, this has just changed everything for me. And I even ended up in prison and it's a good thing. His mind is blown. I think this passage, especially today, we can read it and think, yeah, whatever, whatever, Paul. Yeah, kind of seems a bit obvious or whatever. I think it's a mix of over familiarity with some of the ideas and I think it's a lack of understanding exactly what he's talking about. So today I just want to unpack some of those things that maybe we can get excited about. Maybe we can think about this does change the whole of my life, not just this little add on. So let's hear the readings today. So now you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together we are his house, built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, and the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are carefully joined together in him, becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of this dwelling where God lives by his spirit. When I think of all this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the benefit of you Gentiles, assuming by the way that you know God gave me the special responsibility of extending his grace to you Gentiles. As I briefly wrote earlier, God himself revealed his mysterious plan to me. As you read what I have written, you will understand my insight into this plan regarding Christ. God did not reveal it to previous generations, but now by his spirit, he has revealed it to his holy apostles and prophets. 
and this is God's plan, both Gentiles and Jews who believe the good news share equally in the riches inherited by God's children. Both are part of the same body and both enjoy the promise of blessing because they belong to Christ Jesus. By God's grace and mighty power, I have been given the privilege of serving him by spreading this good news. Though I am the least deserving of all God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of t telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone this mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, has, had kept secret from the beginning. So, interestingly, I would never have gone to this passage to explain what we're trying to do at Exeter Vineyard, but this fits really well with our whole movement and plan with hubs and engaging and, and even doing tools like digging for gems and meditation. So Paul is talking about something really amazing. He calls it a mystery and then he talks about how it happens. And this is in the context of him talking about Jewish insiders and non-Jewish outsiders. Now this can feel completely irrelevant to us today, but these historical points though they're not relevant directly, are often really relevant when we think of them as metaphors or parables or we understand the principles at work underneath them. The Jews were the insiders. They were the insiders on what God was doing. He had revealed to them his plans. He had chosen them to work through them. And since, their, since Adam and Eve's injection from the Garden of Eden, God had been making these amazing promises about how he was going to rescue them to the Jewish people. And then the non-Jews were outsiders. They're kind of in the dark, in the world, trying to figure out, instinctively knowing that there's something supernatural and spiritual going on. And so in the end, kind of filling the gaps with their imagination, they end up worshipping uh, idols for a god for, you know, the mountains, the forests, the sea and all this. And what ends up happening is the Jewish insiders become really arrogant. They become no, or they're very self-secure in their status. And they see the rest of the world as largely irrelevant, thinking, well, some of them might become insiders by clinging on to our coattails, but that's the only way. And so that's the context Paul's grown up with. That's the context that the ancient world worked in. Um, and so the thing that he's talking about, this mystery, is how this totally gets blown out of the water. Um, and it doesn't seem terribly interesting or relevant to us, but it is because this way of thinking isn't just an ancient way of thinking, it's still the default way of thinking about the world. We just don't notice it because it feels so natural to us. It's just like the air we breathe, it's just normal life. So we just think this is the way things are. So in our church, in our personal lives, in our workplace, we, we always have this insider, outsider worldview. And I, I just wanna kind of break it down today so we can perhaps see it a bit more clearly. And for that, we're gonna get the help of Monsieur Flipchart. So uh, this is a super high tech today. Let me just make sure it's positioned correctly. Okay, so I wanna talk about this. So the first thing, look at this for technology. technology. The ancient religion, the way that ancient religions worked and they worked, the God was distant. You know, he wasn't close. He was, he was distant, far away, unapproachable. He was mysterious, didn't really understand the God, the force at work. Um, it was mediated or controlled, so you had priests or insiders who knew how it worked and kind of acted as the, they, between the normal people and this, this God, they were the, the kind of conduit, the connection, the, the uh, communication between them. Uh, these gods were hard to please, you, you, you know, they were, by nature, they weren't for you, so you needed to do things to make sure that they were pleased with you. Um, so it required some kind of work. You needed to do something to make them pleased. Um, you were motivated by fear because they didn't really care about you. you. You were scared because they could just as easily do something nasty as something nice. So there's always this motivation of fear. And finally, uh, it was about conformity, everyone being the same. There were the rituals, everyone does the same thing and this is how you interact to connect in this worldview. So 
This worldview ends up because this really is a reflection of what normal human nature is, the way that we are wired or perhaps the way we're wired because we are broken and fallen and we've, we've lost our connection with God. So this is the way we kind of work. It seems natural. So this happens at church. We have insider and outsiders at church. There are the, those people who seem like the insiders. They know all the answers. They, their lives look correct. They just seem to find the, the stuff easy. It's all very natural to them. And in a church model that's kind of attractional, you know, there's one thing we want people to come to them and it's program led. There's all these organized activities that we want people to join into. In that kind of model of church, the insiders do all the stuff and the outsiders kind of can connect and kind of look on as spectators, maybe thinking about how they can break in, become an insider, become one of the people that does stuff. And I know this because for lots, most of my church experience, I felt like an outsider. I felt like looking at people thinking, wow, they kind of get it. They know what they're doing. It's all, they find it easy and I, I don't feel like that. And so there must be something wrong with me and I need to uh, somehow connect to this, this dist distant and mysterious God, uh, these people are going to help me do it, but I really need to kind of work hard to get there. And I'm worried if I don't, that God's probably a bit peeved with me. Uh, and so I will conform to all the things that they tell me I should do. Um, you know, and I think church often works like this. And one of my frustrations, actually, one of the reasons that I thought, let's, what, how could we do church differently? Was I was really frustrated that a lot of what I felt like I was doing was trying to get people to conform, to, to try and manage people so that they would go to Sundays, a small group, serve on a team, give. And it was all about kind of like, let's just get people to behave a certain way. And I just knew that that wasn't the life that God has for us. And that's one of the reasons that we want to do hubs more like mini churches where people don't spectate but where people own where there's more creativity all of that but this doesn't just happen in church or in religion it happens everywhere so much so there's even a psychological term for it imposter syndrome maybe you've heard this where you are uh, you feel like you don't belong you feel like you're an outsider who somehow ended up inside and you're scared that you're going to get found out so uh, you might be in a group of friends who just seem to have it all to, all going really well. They kind of have these perfect lives and you're only just holding it together and you're worried that someone's going to um, going to expose you. It's all going to come out. And then so you work really hard maintaining an appearance of a perfect life. Or maybe at work where everyone else seems confident and self-assured like they know, know what's going on and you're just waiting for someone to ask you a question that you don't know the answer to and you're, you're really worried. Um, and this is just how we understand what uh, understand life to work. You know, I have a real fear of mispronouncing words, uh, and I just did it today. I talked to someone and I pronounced a word wrong, and I was like, "Oh no!" I feel like now I've exposed myself as I don't really belong. I once did a whole sermon about a character in the Bible and pronounced his word, name wrong, and people came up and told me, and I just felt I felt like, "Oh man, I have blown it. I do not belong. I'm an outsider. I've revealed myself." So these things happen. But this is how we understand life to work. It's a transactional, you know, I do this for you and you do this for me. There's cause and effect. If I do the right things, if I can find these mysterious keys to living life, then good things will happen. And so all of our life is really just an ancient mystery religion. You know, whatever we're thinking of. So a happy life, a successful career, being rich, having an amazing sex life. These are all distant mysteries to all of us, but we look and we think other people have got it. We, th we feel like it's out there and we're missing it. You know, have you ever had someone talk about a benefit that they, they get or there's some tax break when they do this lease, back, lease car thing and you're thinking, oh, I didn't know about that. I'm missing out on something. Or, um, you know, there's, um, you know, social media stories. People's social media, just show them how wonderful and happy they are and we feel like, missing out that everyone else has got this great life I'm missing out every TV show you watch talks about how marriages and sex works and we just think oh, that's not how it is for me obviously there's something wrong I need to work it out so there's all these distant mysteries that we're trying to kind of break in we feel like outsiders and we're always motivated by fear we're, we're missing out on something that there's something else that we're not doing it and so we're working hard to break into the promised land and that and that's what we're doing um, 
and it is so basic to our lives. Let me give you an example. Let me just change my notes. Um, an example of leaving shoes on the mat, okay? So I come home and sometimes I leave my shoes on the mat and this is not acceptable to Sarah. <laughs> so she um, so she will tell me off for leaving my shoes on the mat and I should put them away in the drawer where they're meant to go. And, um, and so there's this kind of like distant, mysterious hope of just being acceptable in my own home that's mediated and controlled by Sarah who is hard to please requires me to pick up my shoes and carry them to the drawer it's like really hard work I'm motivated by fear I do do it now because I just don't want to have all the hassle of being told again why it's so important I do uh, and so I need to conform to this and so I'm not saying this is a bad thing I'm just saying this is how it works this is how we raise our kids don't we we tell them we want them to do that when they don't do it we say well they need to know there's consequences so we punish them it's fine you know and we might do the opposite we could do instead of motivating by fear of punishment we could do motivate by reward but it would still be a bit weird if I put my shoes away and then Sarah comes in and goes oh who's a good boy who's a good boy who put their shoes away well done you <gasps> you're so special you put your shoes away well done well done Dave well done I mean that would be weird as well so anyway I'm just saying this is how we live our lives recognize it but this is what's exciting Paul because he is saying we have tried to live our lives this way when it comes to God and this isn't how it works so he's talking about a new way so this is the way of Jesus is Jesus distant no he is close and intimate he has got so involved in human life that he has walked and eaten and slept and gone to the toilet he is close and intimate is it mysterious no God has been revealed it says in the Bible if you want to know what God is like look at Jesus he's not this mysterious being far away that we don't really know much about we know everything about him is it mediated and controlled oh. no we are offered direct contact with God we don't need someone to talk to God for us we don't need someone to, to manage our relationship with God we are invited into a relationship with God God is already pleased that is his default state he is full of joy we are not trying to make God pleased with us God loves us. He is already pleased with us. Requires work. Well, guess who did all the work? Jesus has done all the hard work already. Work we can never do ourselves anyway that was hopeless for us to do. Motivated by fear, love is the new key. Love is the antidote. Perfect love drives out all fear. Love is the antidote. Conformity in rituals, no. We are empowered individuals. We are, are empowered to be ourselves. It's wholly different. We are not living our life to try and achieve anything. Everything has already been achieved for us. We are open to living in a whole new way. And motivation isn't now by fear of punishment or promise of reward. Motivation now isn't something external that we are reaching for or running away from. It is an internal motivation of love. This is why I should put my shoes away. Not because Sarah's going to tell me off if I don't or patronise me if I do. It's because I love Sarah and it is important to her. So I should put the shoes away because it is the right way to live my life. Not for reward, not to avoid punishment, just because it is an expression of me living out a loving life. You see, with the insider outsider, we are insecure at the start and we are seeking security by our status, by what we do and how we judge ourselves inside or outsider. And it is a fool's errand anyway. It is dis diminishing returns. It doesn't work. Everyone's tried it. No one's ever said I've achieved it. We just think they have. We are invited out of that whole uh, mindset into this where security is already given to us in who God thinks we are. This changes, this changes church from something like an organized, something, an, an organization based around a religion. And so Paul, in this passage, he uses a couple of examples. He talks about a building being built and he says it's built together. And so if you are a brick in that wall, there isn't a question of whether you are in or out. 
you, it's just the fact you are there. And what isn't important now, what the, the, the focus moves from you as a brick to the building and what's inside the building, that you are building a, a home for God where God will live. This is what Paul's saying, so amazing. Um, or the other example is he uses a family. He says, you've now, you are now family. You are now di- shared your DNA. You, can, you can't change your DNA. You are now connected to God. So don't worry about whether you belong or don't belong, whether you're inside or outsider. This is now your reality. Live like it. And this is what's exciting for Paul. And this is what is exciting for me. And as we try and do hubs, is that we change the idea of church isn't an activity, an event, a program. But church is you, church is me, church is all of us living our lives filled with God new people not trying to prove ourselves not trying to earn anything but just motivated internally by god's love to to spill out into the world around us this is how god's at work you know and jesus talks about he says a bit like the yeast in bread it works all the way through the bread and makes a difference everywhere it's like salt that saturates food and just works its way through and the flavor is felt everywhere where you are today, where you will be tomorrow or the day after, you are the church. You have God inside you. You don't have to earn it. He is inside you and he wants to do his work through you. You are invited to that. So this is our vision for Exeter Vineyard Church, that we will be full of people living a God-sized life. Not just those group of people who are confident, who know the Bible, who feel like they belong, that we all would be doing that even those of us who don't feel confident, who don't think we have it all together, but we understand that God doesn't care about that. He's already inside us. And that in our everyday lives, we understand that we have God within us and we are able to be free from insecurities so that we can make a difference to the world around us. And then we come together and we celebrate and we encourage one another and we challenge one another and then we go out and do it all again and we draw other people into this God life as well. That's what we want to do. And so I just want to finish with an application because one of the things that happens to get into this God-sized life is the world, the enemy, the devil, will try and drag us back into this life and will try and motivate us by fear. So to step into that God life, there are a number of fears that we have to overcome. There's a fear of missing out on the benefits that the world offers. There's a fear that if we follow God, we might miss out on some of the things that other people seem to have and that maybe even though we know that they're temporary and they're not godly, but they still might make us happy. So we we got to let go. We've got to say, I'm going to trust that God has all the blessings I need, all the good stuff I need. There's fear of failure. We think, well, maybe if I try and do that, maybe I'll just make a fool of myself. Maybe it won't work. Maybe I'll try and do that and God won't catch me. We've got to learn to be not be afraid to step out in faith. Or maybe there's a fear of discomfort. We know that God's way will require us to self-sacrifice. We might have built a comfortable lives around ourselves and thought, I'm living, I'm living the middle class dream. And then there's this calling of God that requires us to open that up and and share it or invite people in or, or give it away. And that can be scary for us. All these things are not insignificant fears, but they need to be overcome by the love of Jesus that he has for you, that is more valuable than any of those things. So I want to finish with a bit of my translation, my version, my Digging for Gems version about this invitation, this new thing that it isn't about the insiders and the outsiders, but we are invited into family. And I, as I wrote it out, I just concentrated on this idea of family. So this is Ephesians 2, 19 to 22 and 3, 6 to 7, my translation. So you are no longer on the outside looking in. You have been welcomed into the family with all the rights, benefits and responsibilities. God is building a growing family, encouraged by the people who have come before and their insights, but with Jesus at the very centre. It is, it is his DNA that now directs our true life. It is his blood in our veins, his thoughts and outlook shaping our behaviour. This is how God is here in our broken world, through his family. As we take on the family likeness, God himself, as the Holy Spirit, dwells within us, enabling, empowering, directing, shaping, making his home in us and then in the world around us. It is this amazing news, this unexpected and unprecedented revelation that has meant I've ended up in prison. 
The radical truth about God reaching out to all people, him taking the initiative, is too disruptive for the existing power structures of this world. And so I am locked up. So the whole world, all people, can now be one family, God's family. And each of us is entitled to the same family inheritance. Specifically, all the good promises that God has given to Israel since Adam and Eve were first ejected from the Garden of Eden. And all those ancient prom promises that sounded great but were big picture and lacked detail, well now they've all come into focus in Jesus. What he has done, is doing and is going to do. I am entranced by this great news, this news of free, loving rescue to all people. And so now my whole life is given to this great news. All I am is to get this message out. Let's pray. God, we want to be freed from the way that the, everyone sees the world, the way we've always seen the world, to see the world your way, to understand this whole new dynamic. Help us do it, Lord. Help us step into that. And I pray you would reveal to us those fears that would hold us back. And then, God, I pray that we would learn how to come to you with those fears and have them met by your love. Amen. In light of what we just heard, we want to give a moment of quiet to see what God might want to prompt us as individuals. So can I encourage you now to be still and open to what God might want to say to you? Holy Spirit, we invite you to speak to us now. thank you so much for joining us today i hope you have a great week and remember to connect up with one of those hub groups if you're finding yourself a little bit on the outside and disconnected you can email hello at x.vin if you need anything otherwise be blessed and be a blessing to others bye